Okay, uh, I think hopefully everything is ready to go. And uh, yeah, it's our last week of the course, and I think um, it won't be too heavy in terms of introducing new material today because basically we're just doing the second half of this uh, two week exercise in a sense, like exercises six and seven, uh, as mentioned, are quite closely related. And um, we kind of continue on from where we left off last week with what we will be doing today. But uh, maybe before that, I could check in and see how are things going? How did exercise six go? Was it all right? No, generally. Um, yeah, if you have questions about exercise six, I think, um, oops, I think that the deadline, if I remember, for exercise six was Wednesday. Is that right? Yeah. So you still have a, um, a day and a half to, or maybe almost two days, I suppose, because it was Wednesday at, at five o'clock or something like that. Uh, you still have a bit of time, so if you have questions today, there should be time for me to help out with answering questions and things like that. So that's good news, perhaps, to you if you're still working on exercise six. Beyond that, um, yeah, I think we're kind of on to exercise number seven. I did want to note one thing. I posted this in Discord as well, but I did update slightly the final report information um, and maybe before we go into the stuff for, for lesson seven and exercise seven um, maybe we'll just take a quick look at the minor changes to the information about the final report it's not really anything of sort of substance in terms of things you need to do differently but in the final paper information now you will see that there has been some Additional things like I had this use of AI large language model statement thing that was presented in the first class and we never really introduced anything about using things like ChatGPT to do programming. But I did want to note that um, in at least keeping with the idea behind uh, embracing the use of things like ChatGPT that it is okay to use tools like that in the final um, report for the course. So this statement here about the kind of use of large language models being okay is now here and then there's some details underneath that that show up both here on the course web page and also I've updated the information in the template if you use the Jupyter Notebook template to uh, to do the final report. This information is also updated there. What's perhaps important for you folks, if you do decide to use a tool like ChatGPT or Google Bard or whatever you want to use for some kind of language model, uh, you can use it either for the kind of text that you're producing or for the code that's being produced. It's fine to use uh, in either case. But you should have something then uh, in a section called Acknowledgements where you say what tool you used and what version of the tool was used. Um, just to make reference to the fact that this is kind of like a cited resource in a sense. It's not exactly the same thing, but you should acknowledge that you've used a tool like ChatGPT uh, in doing this final report. In addition, I would ask that you have a section in the methods called use of AI tools where you can disclose in more detail what you actually did. So uh, there the idea would be to kind of describe with enough detail um, what you've done that in principle someone could kind of reproduce the work that you've done. So this is kind of what's being asked of scientists who are starting to use these kind of tools in, in writing journal articles and things like that um, is that if you're going like certain publishers have, have said they're not allowing um, authors to use tools like ChatGPT but other journals are saying it's fine to use those kind of tools so long as you disclose how you use them and disclose in enough detail that uh, someone who, who reads the work could possibly try to reproduce the kind of things that you've done. So I think I'd kind of like to have the same idea behind what we do here. 
Uh, so it's kind of a general explanation of what you've done. Like if you use ChatGPT to produce a first draft of your introduction or something like that, um, you could sort of describe that. Or if you used it to write code, uh, then what I would ask for is that you actually list the prompts that you use. Because if you've ever used these kind of tools like ChatGPT, it's basically like a chat and response type system. So you ask it for something, it gives you some response, could be some Python code, and then you run the code and the code doesn't work or whatever and then you ask it to fix one of the problems with the code and it gives you a revised version of the code. Uh, this is basically just you prompting ChatGPT for information. So I'd like if you use ChatGPT for any of the coding that you uh, list the prompts that you were using and also then provide um, a version of the code that was produced and that could go like into the appendix section at the end of the report. So you don't have to use this kind of tool at all like there's, there's no obligation but if you're curious if you want to play around with these kind of tools it's fine but I just want to make sure that you do so in a way that it's clear to me like that you have used tools like that because the university's guidelines on the use of these kind of large language models states that if you use these kind of tools without disclosing it it is similar to plagiarism and it's treated in a similar way so it is uh, important to be clear that um, what you've done and how you've used the different tools. So you'll see then now in the description of the, um, of the format of this final paper, there's now this kind of extra section listed here about the use of AI tools. That applies if you use them. Uh, otherwise, you can just ignore that. Uh, I've also added here that where the acknowledgement section should go if it applies. Uh, if you don't use something like ChatGPT, most probably there's no need for an acknowledgement section at all. Um, and then also I've added a point down here under the appendices that if you have code that was produced by something like ChatGPT, you should put the code into the appendix as well. That's just for the sake of documenting what you've done and how you've done it. Um, ultimately, anything that ChatGPT produces that you use in your final report is considered your work. So if it's wrong, it is also that you are considered to be wrong. So um, it's not a sort of scapegoat to say, well, ChatGPT told me this. So what, I mean, you're still responsible for everything that, that the, the large language models produce. Uh, and that's important, of course, to, to recognize as well, because it can be really useful for certain things, but it also can just make stuff up sometimes. It is just a statistical model. And if you ask it weird questions, it will give you weird answers. So um, that's just the reality of using things like ChatGPT. Anyway, the point here is that if you have already made a copy of the final paper using the GitHub Classroom link that was posted last week, that I think if I've understood what happened, um, I updated the final paper course description, which should mean it deleted your old copy of the exercise. I think, Levy, maybe you were one of the people who had made a copy. Is it gone? Yeah, it should be gone, but it, at least that's what the description of, of, on GitHub said. It would delete the uh, all the student repositories. Did you make a copy last week? Yeah. The old one's still there. Ah, okay. All right, it should at least, I thought, should have deleted the old one. So you should delete it yourself then. Unfortunately, I don't know because I created it as a new assignment. I didn't update the existing one. Um, I was worried that might cause problems, so I just thought it was better to start with a fresh thing. Okay, so yeah, if you already made a copy, then just delete the old one. And uh, and I'll maybe also post that in Discord for, I think, uh, Tafel maybe been, was the only other person who had made a copy so far. Um, but yeah, you'll see here in the template that basically just, oops, not print. Make that bigger. Um, Nothing has really changed here other than the fact that I've added the same kind of like headings to the template and the information about the use of ChatGPT or an equivalent large language model. That stuff is now here in the description text, just like on the web page. Um, and so similarly, there's a kind of you know subheading here about the use of AI tools and the acknowledgement section, etc. Um, yeah, it only kind of occurred to me rather late that we never actually introduced any of this stuff during the course, but I did want to have you have some opportunity if you wanted to play around with these kind of tools to do so. 
And uh, one thing that might be useful is if you look in the template, there is a link. I think it's actually also linked from the, the course page here um, of a, to an introduction on how to use ChatGPT for writing Python code from the GeoPython course. So we introduced this this year in the course to those who took it this year. This is familiar, I assume. But essentially the kind of idea of how to interface with ChatGPT to produce code um, is presented in this introductory material from the GeoPython course where you, for instance, can say write a Python function that adds two numbers. And the response from ChatGPT is a function definition called add numbers that will add numbers A and B and return that value. So um, yeah, that's a good example. But there are certainly cases where you can get ChatGPT to produce code that works but is not correct. Uh, so you have to pay a little bit of attention. Maybe the last thing about this is that in the context of the final paper, I mean, you've already done a lot of the coding in exercises six and seven to produce the code you need to, to make your plots and things like that for, um, for the final paper. So there might not feel like there's that much kind of chat GPT based coding you can do at this stage, but I would say, you know, feel free to play with it. If you want to kind of tinker with like plot formatting or things like that, or just see what it does when you give it certain kind of prompts, or if you want to make, yeah, some, I don't know, modification to what was done in one of the exercises because you think there'd be a nice figure you could include to the final paper. Maybe you can play around with that. But otherwise, you could also do things like ask it to help you in summarizing information from some of the articles that were recommended um, and, and do things like that. So uh, I would say, yeah, it's, it's worth it if you feel like you have the time to, to play around a little bit and just see what it does. I think there was some example in here uh, where we had asked ChatGPT to do something like a temperature conversion and it didn't work. So yeah, we said write a function to convert Kelvins to Newtons. Newtons are an unusual uh, temperature unit that pretty much is not used. Um, probably you're more familiar with a Newton as a measure of force. But of course, when you ask it for a function to convert Kelvin to Newtons, it gives you the function to calculate uh, the force in Newtons by taking the mass multiplied by the acceleration squared, um, which is going to give you the force. Uh, but, uh, but then if you add in temperature in Kelvins to Newtons, it does something like this, which looks about right. The temperature in Celsius times 0.33 is roughly what this Newton temperature scale follows, but it does not account for the fact that like this Kelvin temperature should be converted to Celsius first. So the function looks right, but the values that you get out of it are wrong. So that's the kind of warning just to pay attention that ChatGPT can do great things in writing nice code. Uh, as the examples on the GeoPython page show, it can write like nice doc, doc strings for your functions. You can ask it to add inline comments to your code so it can describe what the code does for you. Um, that's all great, but it doesn't necessarily mean the code is actually correct. So be aware. Anyway, you can find the example on the GeoPython page if you want to play around with, with ChatGPT and just want to see how to get started. Uh, I think that's the kind of updates for the final paper. So that takes us then maybe here to level, level lesson seven. Um, which, as mentioned, is basically just the second half of last week's exercise is what we're doing at this point. Uh, the lecture slides that we have from last time are the same slides that were there in last week's lesson. So I'm not going to go through any lesson like lecture slides. We already saw the introduction to these exercises six and seven last week. The slides are just linked here for convenience. Um, and uh, and the same kind of set of links that we're here about, you know, the, the useful final paper references and Google Scholar and Web of Science, that stuff's all still here in the Lesson 7 overview. So there's not anything new that I'm going to present in this week's lesson, except for exercise number seven. So we can go through that now. And the good news is that um, you'll have time then to kind of get started if you want already on exercise seven while we're here today or if you have questions on exercise six we can also 
uh, discuss those. But in exercise number six, we were basically putting together this thermal chronology model by kind of filling in some of the missing pieces that we had from uh, a combination of things we had done in earlier lessons and then new code to basically bring those things together so that you could calculate temperatures using a thermal model, record a temperature history, and use that temperature history to predict a thermal chronometer closure temperature and then a, a, a cooling age from, uh, from this model. This week, the focus is basically on applying that model to do some, some stuff, which includes uh, eventually comparing your predictions to, uh, to data and trying to estimate what the um, long-term average exhumation rates are from the data set. And again, we're working with data from Bhutan from two papers by Gutan et al. in 2014 and Stuva and Foster in 2001. And the PDFs are available from the course page. Um, our first step in this week's exercise is called a functional model, which is basically we're going to put things together into a single function so that instead of having to go and run all of these individual things like run the thermal model, calculate the thermal history, run the Dodson code, calculate an age, um, that we just basically put a, a kind of wrapper function around all of that. And as usual, you start by checking to make sure things are working from last week. But, uh, but yeah, we have to be able to read in our data file because we're going to compare against some data that are in a data file that's provided for you. It looks like this. So you have latitude, longitude, and elevation of different rock samples. And then if an appetite helium age has been calculated, there would be an age here. In this case, it's minus 9999, which indicates there's no appetite helium age for this sample. Uh, then there would be the standard error for the helium system. Then here we have a zircon helium age, so there is one. And then this is the standard deviation for the zircon helium age. And then this would be the muscovite argon argon age if there was. And there's not, so it's minus 9999. So that's our no data value in this data file. Um, so you can see here there's, uh, I think, some fifth, no, I guess it's 39 samples. And there might be something like 50 ages in total because some samples have more than one age, like might have had multiple thermal chronometer systems from the same bedrock sample. So you have the age data in this data file. And the step one in the exercise is to basically just read that data file in using pandas. And uh, as noted here, it says look back at your old exercises for hints if you don't remember how to read a data file because we've done this before, I think back in week one or week two in the exercise, I don't remember which. So you'll read the data file in and that's step number one. Then in order to compare what we have in our thermal model from last week, our thermal chronometer age prediction model gives us a predicted age. And we have then these measured ages from a data file and we want to compare them using this chi-squared uh, function that you created back in exercise number two. So we're going to basically need to use that one to compare our predicted appetite helium age to the measured appetite helium ages from this data file. And same thing for the other thermal chronometers. In addition, you can do, use the same function to compare all three to get a kind of combined misfit value for the different systems. So that's what you'll do in part number two. Um, there are some hints here that might be useful because one thing, for instance, that we end up with is the expe expected way that this function works is that it expects to have the same number of predictions as it does measured ages. We have one predicted age and we might have 10 measured ages. So there's a little hint in the, um, in the hints for this week's exercise that might help you with dealing with that because instead of modifying your chi-squared function, there's another way you can do the same thing to be able to compare each prediction to, um, to one of the measured ages. So we'll do that and then after that, you're gonna make a couple useful plots. And so uh, this basically is going to be a two panel plot um, 
up on the top you'll have the sort of temperature history part which will show what the geotherm looked like at the start of the model and then what the final geotherm looked like and then also show the kind of temperature history for your recorded sample so these are things you already have and then this is basically just telling you how to make that plot um, and format it so you have the kind of top panel is temperature history the lower panel is going to show the measured ages it's going to have some lines where you show your predicted age because we have in this case it's going to be age along the vertical axis and the horizontal axis is latitude because the samples are on this kind of like north-south transect and then you just have a horizontal line that shows your predicted age because we have only one predicted age for each thermal chronometer system from a given model again you're given some instructions about how to handle this and also a hint if you want to know how to make a horizontal line to plot your uh, predicted age there's a hint here about how to do that and then the last step in here if I'm not mistaken yeah is to basically then put everything together into a single function so the idea is that we have all these functions to do these different operations and we can put them into one age calculator function that will allow us to run everything from start to finish to read in our data file to run the thermal model to predict the cooling ages compare against the data and make the plots all of that can be done in a single function and in fact in few years back I used to just give the students this code that did all this stuff and the problem was it was so complicated like when you get it all at once to figure out what was going on that it was rather confusing but I think when you put the pieces in yourself you'll see like it's actually it ends up being you know maybe uh, might be more than a hundred lines in total but everything kind of fits nicely in there and you can kind of see what each little piece does because you have a function for each one of the things you do you don't have like just the copy pasted code you have a function call and by doing it like that it's it's actually I think relatively easy to follow what the code does um, and I don't know maybe I don't want to scare you by saying 100 lines it might not actually be that that long um, I don't recall but you know it's like you're just gonna copy paste in stuff that you've done before so it's uh, just putting together everything into a single function just so it's easy to use because you're gonna do all these things uh, in a few different uh, scenarios in the next part of the exercise so that's part one again you're given some detailed instructions of what to do and uh, you'll end up with this age calculator function at the end of that the second part is all about trying to compare and fit our predicted ages to our measured age data set. So the first part is basically just to say, let's run a model with these parameters and change only the advection velocity. So only the kind of exhumation rate uh, will change to try to find the, the minimum misfit to the age data set. So if you put in a uh, velocity of you know like 0.25, kilometers per million years your predicted ages are going to be too old and they won't be a good fit to the age data set you'll get a big misfit value as you increase and get closer to the uh, exhumation rate that's kind of consistent with the ages that are, are measured you'll get your misfit value will go down but if you keep increasing the rate eventually your misfit value will start to go back up because now you start to get ages that are too young to match the measured ages so the idea here is that you can start out with the values that are given here and uh, if you just change your exhumation rate or your advection velocity in increments of 0 0.1 kilometers per million years you just do that until you find the kind of sweet spot where your misfit value is the smallest and uh, that way that kind of tells you okay on average for all of these cooling ages the best exhumation rate to fit all of them is going to be whatever value you you come up with so that tells you what the sort of expected rate of exhumation would be in the measured ages as they were brought to the surface by erosion so part one you do that for all the ages and then the next three parts are here we go uh, about trying to see what's the best fit to each of the individual thermal chronometers because the rate of exhumation has varied through time sometimes that's because of differences in the, the plate movement and the kind of fault slip velocity 
but it can also be related to changes in the precipitation and the rate of erosion uh, because this is an area in the Himalaya where glacial erosion has become more efficient in the last five to seven million years and it's also had an increase in the strength of the monsoon which means there's more precipitation and more river erosion so you might see differences in the best uh, exhumation rate that fits the apatite helium ages compared to the zircon helium data and then compared to the muscovite argon argon so you do the first thing to compare against all of them and then you go through system by system and say okay what fits this age uh, this specific thermochronometer the best and I think that's it for part two. The whole idea here is that you're going to produce a plot for each of these different um, things you do in, in part two of this exercise. And that's the majority of what you would need to then put into the final paper are those plots that you produce in this exercise. Uh, you can always choose if you want to do something different in the final paper, modify the plot somehow, but uh, if you present, for instance, the uh, you know the one plot from each of part one, two, three, and four of the uh, second part of this exercise, that's the majority of what I would expect to see, for instance, in the final final paper. So, do you have any questions about this exercise number seven? So if not, um, that's kind of all I have in terms of stuff prepared for today because really uh, I just need to introduce the second part of the exercise. But I'm planning to stick around here. So if you have questions, I'm happy to help out with questions about exercise six or seven or if you have things about the final report or chat GPT or whatever, um, I'll be here for that time. And... Uh, yeah, I guess if there's no questions at this point, then I'll at least turn the recording off and uh, you guys can get started with whatever you want to do. Of course, you're free. If you want to just leave, you can also do that. But um, but it might be a good idea to get started since you're already here with, uh, with exercise seven. So yeah, then I'll switch off the recording and uh, we can go from there.